Hi there. Welcome to our webinar today on citrus greening. I'm Rachel McCarthy and I'm the training and outreach coordinator for the first detector program. Um, before I begin or we begin, I'd like to review some housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar today and we will post the link afterwards. Please revisit the content anytime and be sure to share the information with friends and family to help spread the word about citrus greening. If you have a question uh, during the presentation, please use the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. We may answer the question as we go or hold them for discussion at the end of the presentation. If you experience any technical issues with your video or audio, please use the chat box to let us know. And just to let you know, if you raise your hand, we are unable to chat to you individually. So please use the chat window if you have a problem. Uh, and again, the question and answer box if you have a question for our speaker. So there's still a few people signing in, but I'd like to keep us on time. Um, joining us today to talk about citrus greening is Dr. Monique Rivera from UC Riverside. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Monique who can share a little bit more about her background before we get into um, the content of today's presentation. Thanks so much. Okay, so let's get started today. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm talking about Asian citrus psyllid and Wanglong Bing. Um, I'm an extension specialist at uh, UC Riverside and my appointments on subtropical crops, but with this being such a big issue, my lab focuses very broadly on this topic in many different ways. Um, and so what we're talking about today is a disease of citrus that is vectored or carried by and dispersed by the Asian citrus psyllid. So we're gonna be talking a lot about the Asian citrus psyllid. And so getting into this, you know, why do we really care about this insect? And it, it really comes down to the fact that it spreads Wang Long Bing, which is a lethal disease of citrus. Um, and so I did a postdoc in Florida before coming to California. And during that time, uh, you know, I got to see a lot firsthand at ground zero what HLB does. And so these are pictures literally from my iPhone from when we would go to the field. So here's a picture of a citrus grove and you can see that the entire um, edge of this grove is dead. And yes, that is due to Huang Long Bing. And uh, the reason why the edge in particular looks so bad is because that is where Asian citrus psyllid congregates um, and has made that area of groves more risky for getting the disease. The other thing that you see in infected trees in Florida, which is the ground zero of Huang Long Bing, is really bad looking fruit. So these are supposed to be juice oranges and it's hard to tell what's going on here because the color is so off. And there, throughout the state there are trees that are of varying levels of decline. This is a, a field site that we were using and you can know also how just how sandy the soil is here on the ground. So that poses a lot of other issues for growers in Florida. This is a figure from Grow Intel, and I like this figure because it really puts all this in context. Um, the Florida citrus production, mostly what they're doing there is juice oranges, and that has declined by about 50%, and it's to the tune of almost a billion dollars a year. Um, and so I think in and I'm sure most of you guys are based in the US. Uh, so you're familiar with this idea that orange juice in Florida, there's this very tight correlation uh, with us thinking about it that way. And this is kind of interesting because throughout the talk, I'm going to tell you about a lot of things that happen to the fruit, including how sour the fruit is. And so a lot of times people, when I give this talk, wonder, okay, well, so orange juice comes from there. Why doesn't it taste sour? Well, the thing is, is that when it comes to orange juice, you're talking about industrial production. So it all is homogenized and then the flavor compounds are added back in to make sure the flavor is consistent. So for some people, that's a lot of broken dreams. Other people know that that is actually um, how this process works. In terms of citrus production, it's only really produced in, in a couple areas throughout the world, and that really has a lot to do with climate. So they really thrive in this sort of Mediterranean climate or subtropical climate, 
And so all of these citrus production areas um, outside Africa, I think they've just found Asian citrus psyllid and they have the other strain of sea loss, which is the bacterium. But, and also in the Mediterranean basin in Europe, you don't, they have not reported any HLB. So they're in sort of a pre HLB phase, but pretty much everywhere else has experienced HLB and is dealing with it. I think, I think it's still an, an import concern in Australia as well, but all throughout Asia and all throughout the Americas, uh, this is a critical disease. And so when it comes to this, and especially being from California, it's really not just about saving the citrus industry. It's really, it's a really much broader thing. And that has to do with the relationship of people have with their trees. In California, there is many backyard citrus trees as there are commercial. So people have a relationship with citrus here. You know, they grow up with it in their backyard. And this was also true of Florida pre HLB. Um, and it also has a lot to do with why UC Riverside even exists because it was first a citrus experiment station and it was considered, you know, the other gold rush is that citrus culture coming to Riverside County was huge for the development of the area. And then I like to make this joke, maybe some of you will think it's funny, maybe you won't. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm just a girl from the East Coast and so this imagery has also really connected with me in a more broader sense and I think a lot of people think of citrus when they think of California as well. And it's really deep in our culture to the point that it's used in many different ways. Uh, so when I gave this talk at the Huntington Library, uh, literally a day before there was by this very fancy expensive, you know, fashion brand, they had done a photo shoot in front of the citrus trees. And I'm just thinking of how much this symbolizes for our culture subconsciously. And before I even uh, moved to Florida and started working on oranges, I read this book. John McPhee is a author who was a, wrote a lot for the New Yorker. And he basically did a really deep dive into oranges. And if you're really fascinated by this idea of the culture of oranges and humans and the relationship with them, this is a perfect book to read. But there's a lot more to the story in terms of our relationship between citrus and Huang Long Bing in the, in the broader context. And so it, it's currently spreading in the Los Angeles basin. And so this is a food security concern. And so food security is really just the state of having reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. And in Los Angeles County, we have the largest population of food insecure people in the United States with 30% of low, low income in individuals uh, being food in insecure. So there's over 1 million in LA County that are um, in CalFresh, which is the, our nutrition assistance program in California. And there, despite there only being 1 million enrolled, 66% of people who are, there are 66% of people who are eligible for nutrition assistance that are not even uh, involved in CalFresh. So that number is a lot larger. If you're interested in this and this cause, uh, goodfoodla.org really goes into a lot of detail about the context for Los Angeles and food security. So um, this is a broadly thing in, in areas where you have people able to cultivate citrus and other tree fruit in their backyards. These tree fruit diseases take a much even harder hit to uh, people that depend on those backyard trees for food. So with trees being re regularly removed in that region, we've removed almost 2000 of them at this point. This is a big context. And so what that looks like currently, and this is, um, basically our quarantine zone, this red. So this is HLB quarantine. So anytime they find a tree, this red uh, circle expands by 400 meters. And uh, as you can see, these circles are about to connect and it's not a good situation. And it's just progressing. Uh, so hopefully we'll come up with a cure for citrus to green it, greening at some point or HLB as I'm calling it in this talk because uh, it would be nice to see citrus uh, that's been removed restored back to this region. So how does Huang Long Bing spread? There's really two methods. And the first one is humans. Uh, we have lots of people that are into grafting 
uh, as a hobby. And if they're not grafting with clean material or they're bringing material in from infected regions because they want a specific variety, that's really problematic because that is going to absolutely transfer the pathogen. And then of course we have our vector insect, the Asian citrusilid. So now I'm gonna dive more into uh, just the nerdy entomology stuff where we're talking a lot about the biology of these insects and the relationship with the plant. So there's some characteristic features here. Uh, they sit at this 45 degree angle and that's in part to get their mouth parts in, in contact with plant material. They have this mottled coloration around the outside of their wings and a jumping behavior. The jumping behavior doesn't express itself all the time, but if they're disturbed enough, they will almost bounce off like a flea. Um, and they also, if not disturbed to a certain degree, will walk and hide on the plant. So similar to what a stink bug does, where you will look at whatever flesh point, say, they're feeding on, and it's almost like they see you and they'll start walking away. So their host plants are all known citrus varieties and relatives in the family Rudiaceae. And they can disperse about 1.5 miles within 12 days. And of course, the most important thing in this context is that they vector Wang Lung Bing. So what are they doing really on the plant? Uh, well, they're feeding on the phloem sap of the plant. And what the phloem sap is, is basically um, the phloem, I like to explain it as a the circulatory system of the plants in which they are passively moving nutrients throughout. So what the insects are doing is putting their piercing sucking mouth parts onto the plant and trying to tap into that stream of phloem sap. And so in contacts, this is also, you know, part of the plant where you would only move nutrients and then the xylem tissue is where the plant moves water. So those two things are separate, but you, they also can feed in the xylem. But because HLB is a phloem limited disease, this feeding on the phloem sap is really crucial for the transmission of the disease. Uh, they're of course also laying eggs. So when they are on the, on the flush points especially, um, they're laying eggs there because that's where their nymphs are going to survive or their immature stages. The adults are able to feed on all leaf stages. And of course, as I mentioned, they have these piercing sucking mouth parts. So I'm an entomologist, so I always love showing pictures like this. We like to zoom all the way in so that we can see precisely what we're talking about here. And when I say piercing sucking mouth parts, what I really mean is this. So you have uh, around the, the base of it, you can, they're circling the trichoid sensilla um, for the labial tip. But as you travel down that, you can see a needle-like structure, and that is indeed what they are doing. So what they're doing is puncturing the plant and then this is getting into the phloem sap. And the reason why adults are able to feed on all leaf material, but nymphs are not, is because when they're adults, this, this structure becomes highly sclerotrized and can puncture all of the different stages. Uh, the nymphs need that soft flush material to be able to puncture into the leaf material because uh, theirs is less sclerotized, they're soft bodied. And so the context for that, when it comes to tracking down these populations, is that you need to follow the flush. So this is what citrus flush looks like. This is not lemon flush. I, I learned when I came to California that this is not at all what lemon flush looks like. Um, it's actually purple on the tips, which is odd. Um, and so this stage one is where the you're going to find your nymphs. Um, you'll find them sometimes on two and three, but by four and five, you're really not going to see many nymphs, but the adults are also going to be feeding here. So what do those nymphs look like? Well, they have these five instar stages and the eggs are this teardrop shaped RNG color, which I'll show in later pictures, but they're very weird looking. So what's happening is you can kind of see the different stages by how big the wing pads are and these little sections to the two sides. Those are the wing pads and those are expanding as the insect grows. And like I've said, and I'll be saying multiple times throughout the talk, they're really only able at the nymphal stage to feed on the soft waxy tissue at the tips of the flush. So now in color, um, this is what they look like. I One time I gave this talk and, and I had an audience member be like, wow, they're like little Pikachus. So that has been etched into my brain uh, with the little red eyes and tiny, uh, 
black antennae. Uh, but you're probably wondering, okay, well, what's this white stuff? Now we're really zoomed in here. Um, in person, this almost looks like strands of white hair. Um, so what this is, is that they're feeding in the phloem sap. And the phloem sap is how the plant is transmitting nutrients. And a lot of those nutrients are sugars. And so what happens for the insect is that there are excess sugars and it expels them out of its back end. Now, this is very similar to an aphid. An aphid also puts out a substance called honeydew out of its back end. This is also referred to as honeydew. But why this looks differently is because it's covered in a waxy coating. And so here's another zoom in of our little Pikachu-like guy. Um, and so here we have a, another flush shoot. And like I said before, this is really what's required for nymph survival. And so tree flushing is really a limiting factor for the development of these populations. Uh, and when it comes to zooming way in on, on what it might look like when you're at a very, very early stage. Um, so this is very, very brand new flush that hasn't expanded at all. And you can see that there are those tear, shop, tear shaped eggs embedded in this new flush material uh, with a couple early, very early instars. And so there's a theory in entomology that is called mother knows best. Uh, and what, what that theory is, is that uh, when a female insect oviposits, which is a fancy way for saying laying eggs, she chooses the best material for her offspring to survive. So um, that's what's going on right here. Uh, the, the female insects are very savvy in the sense that this is the only place you'll find the eggs. And so therefore, that's the only place you're really going to find the nymphs as well. So ACP also caused damage to the leaf material and that's because when they are sloshing back and forth through that straw-like structure, they're also depositing toxins to help break down that harsh plant material. And so you see the effects of that after in a couple ways. So this burned off tip, now this can also be heat damage, but it is a sign of ACP too. Um, but a real characteristic sign is this leaf notching. And that's because at a very early stage, that leaf was affected by the toxins and has curled up a bit. The other thing that's not uncommon to see with a high population, and here you can see those white hairs at a better angle to give you more context for what that might look like. Um, the adult insects also excrete honeydew for the same reason as the nymphs. And that can make the citrus leaves sticky. So here in California and also in Florida where you get a lot of winds, sometimes that can make the leaves look almost dirty because it's picking up uh, debris that's moving with the wind. And here is basically freshly hatched adult ACP and they're called tenerals, meaning that they are freshly hatched and they're whitish, yellowish, and they're developing that mottled color and darkness before they take off. This is true with a, a lot of insects that there's this stage. So to put that in context, um, what really happens is that four to six weeks from nymph to adult, that's really temperature dependent. At the ideal temperature, you're going to see closer to four weeks. Um, but at a less ideal temperature, or, but one that's still fairly good, you'll see six weeks from egg all the way to adult. So one thing that we know from some of the transmission work and acquisition work uh, of the pathogen is that if you have nymphs feeding on infected material, it's very, very likely that they're going to carry the bacterium with them as they turn into adults. And that's because the bacterium is not really great for their gut. It actually kills off cells within the gut and it establishes in a pocket there almost as it kills off some of the stomach cells. And so that establishment uh, is easier to get as a nymph because they're younger and they are feeding more consistently on the plant. Adults, however, can also acquire it by feeding on infected material, but we don't know precisely a lot about that interaction in terms of for how long, how infected the plant is. And a lot of that has to do with us not being able to culture the bacterium. I think later in this, I will mention a little bit more about that. Uh, when it comes to technology to detect the pathogen, it takes us about nine months to two years to detect the disease in a plant. And that's true for a handful of reasons. Um, in particular, the pathogen is not consistently distributed through the plant. So you're basically betting that you're going to find it when you pull, say, 10 leaves off of a tree that has 10,000. 
Um, so it's very hard to detect and it does accumulate first in the roots. So, but sampling the roots is very complicated and you're, you're basically faced with the same exact thing with the leaves. Uh, you have to find the right root. So like I said before, it's a phloem limited bacterial disease, meaning that this bacterium only establishes in this phloem area of the plant. And so what happens when the disease gets established is that it limits the plant's defenses. And what it does is it upregulates, which is sort of a molecular term, but I just imagine increases um, things that the plant can do that aren't ideal. So the, the plant's defenses are put into overdrive and they basically create um, starchy material in the phloem. And so the phloem's the arteries of the plant really. And so I like to speak of this as it clogs the arteries. And that's why you see an, a, an unbalanced uh, distribution of this modeling pattern on the leaves. And again, I like to emphasize too that we don't have a solution to this. Uh, there's not even really good recommended therapeutics, but I really think we're at the precipice of finding out more about how to sort of live with this disease. So when it comes to HLB detection, like I said, this is really flawed and, and hard to deal with, especially from a homeowner perspective, because the symptoms are delayed and the symptoms are not really characteristic of the disease. Here in uh, California, we have another pathogen that's a bacterial pathogen that's not lethal and doesn't cause yield loss called citrus stubborn. And that looks very much so like HLB on the leaves. So it confuses uh, backyard growers a lot because they're like, oh my gosh, my plant has HLB, but they might call CDFA, our California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the plant gets tested and there's no response because no news is good news. So it's, it's hard to tell. Um, however, when you start getting misshapen and sour fruit, that's a really good sign that something's going wrong inside the plant. And the molecular detection, like I said, it's, it's flawed in the sense that we can't pinpoint the bacteria until we actually find it in that assay. And the reason why that assay is so dependent on, at least, well, especially in California right now, is because from a regulatory standpoint, that is legally how you say that this tree has HLB and this tree does not. So like I said, the, um, when it comes to HLB, it, the leaf symptoms are in no way indicative that you actually have it. But if you do look at for leaf symptoms, what you're finding is that along this midrib center of the leaf, you have yellowing patterns that do not match each other across the midrib. So it's not symmetrical. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you clog up the ar arteries sort of randomly throughout the plant, the distribution of nutrients is uneven. And so that's what's being reflected here. And so a lot of times it can be mistaken for other nutrient deficiencies. However, um, with other nutrient deficiencies, you're gonna see those uh, mirror along that midrib. So if it's deficient in say zinc, like shown here, you can see that this is very much so symmetrical across this midrib in terms of how it's moving across the veins. So the fruit characteristics. So this is an actual picture of a harvest from Florida where you have a lot of HLB, it's, in, it's almost endemic at this point. And it's hard to tell what you're really looking at because it looks so bad. <laughs> um, however, this is really giving you visual clarity on what it ultimately might look like if your backyard tree, so to speak, would, would get HLB um, in this manner. So these are supposed to be juice oranges. They're supposed to be orange. And the reason why they also call this disease citrus greening is because that's exactly what happens. You're, you're having a greenish fruit, a not well-developed fruit, and also a sour and misshapen fruit. So when I got to Florida, I was all excited because they had a variety collection there. So when all the citrus was coming on a me and, and the lab that I was in, we would go out to the field and be like, yes, let's go try all these varieties. Well, it's not, it doesn't taste very good. Um, it's interesting. You can have a conversation about how this one tastes versus this one, but it's not a good uh, tasting fruit at all. And so just like with the leaves and that imbalanced transmission of nutrients throughout the pl plant, you also see this uneven pattering in the fruit. So you're also going to find small aborted seeds. They're not, they're not pretty or tasty fruit. 
So let's talk a little bit more about molecular tools. I like to show this just because if you're not familiar with it, what's going on here is you're basically obtaining DNA from the plant material and then pipetting, this is a pipette right here, very small volumes of liquid and trying to detect that DNA, that target DNA that you're looking for. In this case, it would be the target DNA of the HLB bacterium. And so like I said previously, this is right now the state of the art to confirm the disease presence. However, there's been quite a few um, developments in terms of using, say, HLB detector dogs. Um, so there's, there was a, publish, a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it has really strong evidence that indeed the dogs are detecting the bacterium in the plants and that they are able to do that sooner than these molecular tools. So we're kind of at a middle point here, so I want to do a little bit of a, a recap, so to speak, and you can enter your answers in the chat box, but let's start out by what are some adult ACP characteristics that I mentioned? So feel free to type that in the chat box, and I'll try to bring that up on my end. It might also be that we don't have a chat box. We do have a chat box. I see people putting stuff in if you can see that. Okay, yeah, I finally was able to pull it up. Yeah, we got raised butt, love that. It explains what we're talking about. So yeah, okay, we've got the 45 degree angle. That's really key. That's how they sit on the plant and the modeling pattern around the outside edges of the wings on the adults. So how about ACP nymphs? How many stages are there? And what do they feed on? So feel free to go ahead and type your answers in the in the chat box. I love the Pikachu um, analogy. I see somebody put that in. <laughs> yeah, I would not. I would not have known how to spell that. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like you guys are really getting it. So five stages, um, and then everything is found on new flush here. So what about HLB symptoms? What might you find, um, regardless of whether it is an actual um, something that you could use for detection? Yeah, so you guys are getting it. Uh, uneven leaf modeling, misshapen fruit, and the fruit is the wrong color. So now last question, type in the chat, how do we detect the HLB? Great, so you guys are getting it. Some of you are cheating because you're scientists so you already know some even more technical words for that process. So yeah, it is molecular tools. I like to sum it up like that. And now we're getting towards the end of the talk, but just as a reminder, you know, this is a problem that affects citrus production almost worldwide. So this is an old map that shows, and I think it's from 2013. So or actually, it must be before that, 2010. And so you can look at this and see that, you know, Asian citrus salad was here in the Americas for a while before we started to see an explosion of the disease. And so the context for the world and world citrus production is that humans are moving stuff all over the world all the time. Um, and you can address this on a local scale and, and get community members to play a role, but, um, you know, it really, really comes down to a matter of time. You know, if it, the world can barely get on the same page about handling the, the global pandemic, so it's going to be hard to get everyone on the same page to make sure this insect isn't moved around. But at least in the um, in our local communities, we can make some recommendations for things to do. Um, and one of those things is that if you're buying trees in the nursery zone in California from nurseries within the quarantine zone, they'll have these tags on them. And that's just a reminder not to move plant material around. 
Um, you don't know if you are moving an infected plant around and with the high establishment of the Asian citrusilla, that plant could very easily become infected. So more broadly speaking, what can community members do to help? Um, so if you graft citrus, using only disease-free budwood is critical. Um, that's available through the Citrus Clonal Protection Program, which is, can be found at the ccpp.ucr.edu. Um, also planting only disease-free material from a reputable nursery. So if you're a world traveler and you find a citrus variety that you really like and you wanna bring it back to the United States, not a great idea because that's how pathogens are really spread throughout the world. It's one of um, the main ways they're transported and that's why the USDA is very concerned with our ports of entry. They're trying to make sure that plant material and other stuff is not coming into the United States that could have a broader effect on our essentially national food security. So emphasize that enough. Um, and then for my California people, um, we have a very organized, very expensive program that is science-based trying to limit the spread of this disease. And so I like to tell my community members here in California, and I'm sure there's some of them on here, to allow these people to inspect, test, and treat your trees. Um, the context here is that if your tree does get HLB, it's going to be destroyed anyway, uh, legally, and there's going to be no recourse there. So um, yeah, also don't be mean to those people. They're just people trying to do their job. Um, so one of the other things that we've been introducing is that um, in the quarantine zone, it's becoming so widespread that we're starting to message to people that it might be worth removing your citrus right now, waiting for a cure. And we have a whole program grant project with CDFA where we're trying to recommend other uh, great backyard trees for Los Angeles Basin residents and showing them how to cook and use those foods in the same way. Also, if you're in California and you think you have the pester disease, um, it's important to call CDFA and let them know. And I have a slide about that in, this, in the next slide is about that. Um, and then in general, so what I said about, you know, people moving things around, you know, it, you, it's very likely you don't live in a citrus production area, but it's very likely that you live in an area where something like this is going on. And so you can do general pest reporting at firstdetector.org. So if you're in California and you need to report either ACP or potential HLB, there is the CDFA hotline um, and also their website where you can send through um, information about where you are, et cetera. Um, and also on that CDFA website, you can sign up for the ACP HLB uh, updates. And so that also will let you know about the expansion of the quarantine zone, et cetera. So using firstdetector.org, so here's the, the website. Um, and if you go to about and report a pest, you can use this website to report a pest. It, it's highly likely that maybe your state government doesn't have infrastructure to report a pest that's a problem in your area or a newly introduced pest. Um, so this is a really great tool that can be used uh, regardless of the context. And so they're asking questions, you know, like what's pest species, what state, what county, and you can also give your um, coordinates. Another cool thing that we developed at UCR for my California-based people is this app. And so if you go to this website, which is ucnr.edu backslash HLB app, this pops up. And so what you can do is you can enter your address here. And so when I entered my work address, here is what pops up. Basically, it's telling me how close I am to an HLB detection and um, letting me know that tree removal is happening nearby. And it also recommends to remove and replace your tree with a non-citrus fruit tree. So that, that's been kind of controversial, but that's just where we are right now. And we're really hoping for a cure. Um, and I can see a question in the chat right now about there is a new peptide treatment uh, that was developed by Hyaline Jin. So right now, uh, what's going on with that is that there is a commercial, a commercial contract in place, but none of the data on this peptide has been released publicly. So as an extension specialist, it's very important for me to only share science-based information. And so right now, this is in the progress of development. And once it gets published, 
and is out there and has been peer reviewed, then I will start to make broader comments on, on how this fits into HLB management. And okay, let's see, I've got another one here. Yes, yeah, so you're you're at the Huntington Gardens, Kathy, and, and it's such a beautiful place. Um, I love it there. And it was such a pleasure to be able to give this talk there. And I hope to at some point be able to go back. So that is the end of my talk. So if you guys have any questions, I didn't ramble too much here. Usually this talk goes on a little bit longer. Um, so please, if you have questions, ask. I will jump in while people take some time to um, put their questions into the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, just to clarify about the reporting, um, we have partnered with EdMaps for reporting just because as a national program, it's difficult to say what people can do, you know, in every individual state. Sometimes, you know, reporting is handled, you know, in New York, it's um, might be Department of Environmental Conservation, it might be Ag and Markets, you know, so Edmap, EdMaps allows us to um, provide something for everybody. And then what happens when you report, um, that goes into um, an identifier's queue, like they get a notification email, and then somebody follows up um, with that report. Absolutely, you know, what we're looking to do here is just have people report, um, in any way and we're trying to keep that simple. So if you, you know, know um, where you can report in your individual state, that's always an option. So I just wanted to throw that out there if people have, you know, you don't have to use that platform. It's just a platform so people don't, we don't want to lose people in their search for figuring out where or how to report. Yeah, not all that government stuff they might do a great job of setting up the program, but publicizing it is always a problem. Getting it to the right people. Yes, I think that it's just everybody, you know, 50 states and, and then some we, it's just hard to, you know, everybody does it a little bit differently. Let's see. So has ACP jumped to any other fruit tree other than citrus? Michael Pitts is asking this question. No, um, they cannot feed on those 12. They can feed on them. Um, you know, it's been found recently in the literature that they'll, during a dormant period, or if citrus is not around, they will feed for a bit just on sort of the water of other plants, but the bacterium is not gonna affect those plants. It's, it's only a pathogen for citrus or um, plants in the family Rudiaceae. So I have a question and of course somebody's mowing right outside my window. Um, so I apologize for that. But so is there any benefit, Monique, to psyllids? Like there's no symbiotic relationship, right? It's just an unfortunate, you know, situation that the bacteria is spread by these psyllids, but there's no benefit to them feeding on infected trees, is there? So they have a really complicated relationship evolutionarily. So the theory is, is that it's actually a gut microbe that went rogue in the sense that it jumped to the plant. So it's originally an insect gut pathogen that was not very successful and began to establish in the trees. So if you think about uh, bacterium or any uh, thing on earth that's trying to survive is they'll do the best that they can even if it's not an ideal situation. Um, and the fitness of the insects when they are carrying HLB is actually lower. But the weird thing um, is that the plants that carry the HLB bacterium are actually more attractive to the psyllids than plants without it. So that has huge context for the spread of the pathogen. And are they able to manage it? Like, if can you treat for the psyllid or treat, you know, in a preventative fashion? Yes, so we've kind of discouraged backyard people from doing treatments because what they have available is just not strong enough. It's very hard insect to control even with agricultural technical chemicals. Um, and that's because it's so small and the trees are large and getting the right coverage. Um, and not a lot of the insect, a lot of the insecticides are 
greatly efficacious. For example, organic growers have a really hard time controlling this insect because they don't have really great insecticidal materials. Um, but the best way for growers um, to prevent the spread of the disease is absolutely to manage the vector. So what's unique about the finger lime that makes it resistant to HLB? So I'm not really too familiar with that, to be quite honest, but if you've ever seen a finger lime, they are absolutely bizarre. Um, so I would assume, at least in the context of that peptide, um, it seems like their physiological components of that plant are different as such that I would assume that that peptide has antimicrobial uh, characteristics in it and that the finger lime itself, the phloem material is less habitable to the HLB disease. We have a question from Mary um, about ornamental citrus. That's in the question Q&A. have so many things open. If you could repeat the question, I'm going to mute myself because of the lawnmower, but if you can just read the comment and question. Yeah, I just have to pull up this. Uh... Here we go. Q&A. Don't live in a citrus growing area. There are many citrus being grown as sold as interior plants where I live. Um, okay, so Mary Glover is saying, I don't live in a citrus growing area, but there are many citrus being grown and sold as indoor plants where I live. I suppose it is possible I would call ornamental, that I, what, what I would call ornamental citrus can get this as well. These plants produce citrus, but on a small scale. Yeah, those plants are susceptible, but it's very incredibly low risk because it's an indoor plant um, and the psyllid is not gonna survive outside where you live, I'm assuming, if you're growing the, the citrus inside. So it's very, very low risk. So in a way you get an advantage because you get to enjoy the beauty of the citrus tree while not um, having to deal with all those risky stuff. Okay, so Benjamin is asking, could you briefly explain how Asian citrus psyllids are monitored in groves? So they're generally monitored by humans actually. So um, there's a couple different ways that you can look for them. Uh, one of them is a process called tap sampling. So you basically take a clipboard or some sort of flat uh, board and then tap the tree. Uh, we like to do it three to five times and then the adult insects will lay on your flat surface and they'll be disturbed or shocked enough that they'll sit there and if you have a really good eye for identifying them you can have a count. So we just do that systematically throughout groves. Um, the other thing that you can do in terms of finding them when it's not an adult is look for those flush and inspect your flush. And that's, that's where you're gonna find your nymph. So that stage one flush, getting up close and personal with a hand lens. If you're really good and have a really trained eye, you'll be able to see it with the naked eye, but it takes time. So Miguel is asking, I know this won't work on a commercial level, but for backyard planting with a physical barrier such as a fine screen cloth work. Yes, absolutely. That'll keep the insects away. And um, I think that some of the questions are disappearing too quickly. So if somebody's doing that. Um, so um, the other thing that you can do in your backyard would be plant it in a shadier area. So originally citrus is an understory crop um, that grew in the shade and the psyllids are attracted to light so they will move to the edges of groves in part because of the light distribution on the edge. But in your backyard, if you planted your citrus in a shadier part of your backyard, you will definitely see that you will get less citrus or less uh, psyllids on there. Um, will the HLB, Lan Jen is asking, will the HLB bacteria infect all the citrus species? Yes, to varying degrees. So there is uh, what's called tolerance. Um, and I think even with the finger lime, I wouldn't call it true resistance necessarily. It's that it takes them a lot longer and the uh, bacterium doesn't develop well there, but it still can get it over intense exposure over time. Um, and so Danny Brucius is saying, look for ants too. Yes. Um, I didn't talk about that in this talk because I felt like it might be too in the weeds um, for a lot of for a national talk. 
But here we have this ant species called the Argentine ant. And what they're called, well, what they are referred to as in terms of how they live their lives, so to speak, is that they're a super colony. So usually ants, even if they're the same species, but they're from a different colony, will be aggressive towards each other. And with Argentine ants, they have many colonies, but none of them are aggressive towards each other. So what happens when you have a honeydew producing insect like a psyllid um, or aphids, these ants are going to use this sugar source. And in turn, the nymphs of the psyllid or aphids in return are going to get defended by the ants. So for example, um, if ants are tending this, they're especially Argentine ants because they can recruit in very high numbers, meaning, and by tending, I mean removing this waxy substance that's sugary and using it, eating it. What you're going to see is that your predators and parasitoids are not going to have access to these psyllids. Um, because the ants are just going to eat them. They're going to defend the psyllids because they're essentially on a small scale farming the psyllids for this sugary material. Monique, I have another question about timing and when to scout. And this might sound silly for those people who live in areas where citrus is grown, but coming from mm -hmm. um, way up in the Northeast, I don't know how to give people guidance as to when they should be monitoring their plants. So maybe so, maybe you're so familiar with it that it's, I just don't understand how to suggest that. So uh, for the adults monitoring all year long, at least monthly, but the real thing is to follow this flush. Once your plant starts flushing and has these little flush buds on them and, and further up leaves. That's what you want to be looking for. You want to look for the nymphs. Um, and you can pretty much like rip off these flush points with the nymphs and they're not really going to go anywhere. They're not great movers. Um, the other thing you can do is use safer soap to remove them from those flush points. Um, but if you have nymphs, that means you have adults. And so the different varieties flush at different frequencies and how you treat the plant also influences how it flushes. So for example, let's do our worst case scenario, lemons. Lemons, um, especially when you're closer to the coast and you have a little bit more humidity, not necessarily in the desert, um, you're gonna have flush on that plant at all times. So you'll always have something to look at if you have a lemon tree. If you have a, say a sweet orange, a navel, um, what you're gonna find is that um, you have a distinct flushing pattern throughout the year. So here in California, we have about three flushing patterns, once early in the year, once late summer, and then another one in the fall. And so it's important to catch those times so that you can find the insect and uh, consider your treatment options. How many psyllid generations per year in CA? Oh, what a great question, Ron. We don't really know, lots. It depends on how, um, Again, what they have access to. In lemons, you can have uh, ACP feeding and reproducing all year long because they have flush at all times. So it's really bad, um, especially for backyard growers that are adjacent to uh, commercial agriculture because the commercial agriculture, they can do everything that they possibly can. But if that backyard grower is not doing their part to consider what's going on, they're gonna be constantly reinfested from the backyards. So Danny's asking, are there other insects also responsible for the misshapen leaves? So yes, um, you can find leaf damage that looks somewhat similar by the leaf miner. The leaf miners like this new flush material too, and they'll crumple up the leaves, um, but they're so bad that you'll really be able to tell the difference between, uh, between psyllid damage and a leaf miner, because a leaf miner is going to, you'll see the actual mines on the backside of the leaves and uh, yeah, the leaves just look really crumpled. All right, I don't see any other questions. I'm gonna give people a few more minutes because we've had a steady flow of them um, and I'll just cover a little housekeeping stuff, give people one last chance to throw some, their questions they've been sitting on all presentation um, we do have another webinar um, scheduled for next week, and that is on the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, also contrast that the emerald ash borer, which is still spreading around the country, 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Asian longhorn beetle was found in South Carolina uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if it's been a month or more at this point, um, but that is sure to be another informative presentation. So join us there. Uh, we are recording this and the, um, I think we put in the chat window where you can access the recording to this presentation and the previous uh, webinars. And that's the same place where you uh, signed up for this presentation. Have we had any new uh, questions? I don't think so, but you know, it's important for people to also listen about these forest pests because in a lot of ways, that's a lot scarier to me. And it's not always the highly managed environment. So they just spread with no, no limits, no intervention really, depending on how large the space is, it's pretty scary. Yeah, it is. And I don't, you know, I, I don't think I ever would have guessed that ALB would have popped up in South Carolina, knowing that it can show up anywhere. But it was, I'm sure it surprised quite a few people, especially the folks down there. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to change the complete composition of forests in, in the South throughout yeah. the country if it spreads that, that way. Yeah, our final presentation after that, unless I schedule some other ones, will be on um, Phytophthora remorum, sudden oak death and remoran blight. So another one that I think is definitely of interest to people out on the um, Western, in the Western part of the country. So, all right, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So let's start to wrap up. Monique, thanks so much. Uh, it was really great talk. Um, I like the Pikachu reference. Um, yeah, you have another program to get off to. So I think we're getting you there right on time. It's true thing, given one more talk. There you go. All right, thanks so much, Monique, and everybody else for joining us today. Uh, Monique is on Twitter. Are you on Facebook too? I no, Facebook for me. <laughs> okay. She's active on Twitter if you'd like to um, find her there. And I guess that's it. I mentioned ALB next week. So thanks for joining, and we hope to see you guys soon. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. All right.